Love between the man and the woman is foundational to human society because that love leads to children and you can't have society without life, without children. The roles of mothers and fathers are unique. They're different because God created us, male and female. So men and women are complementary. They're not interchangeable. The Trinity has been depicted as a triangle, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And within human life, we have an icon, a smaller version of that, and that is the family, that is husband, wife, and child. Family, ideally, is where you have parents. We have a husband and wife, a mother and a father, and then you have children. And so that family unit is the most basic unit of civilization. Marriage is the foundation of the family because for a family to be stable and for it to be an environment that is ideal for raising children, children have a right, a God-given right to live in a family with their father and mother. That is what God had planned from the very beginning. Christian marriage is not fulfilled as it's designed simply by the couple looking into one another's eyes, though that is crucial and that's the starting point. But it's also looking into the eyes of these others that they have created with God's original help. It's now engaged in this enterprise of bringing children forth for the kingdom of God, communicating to children that they have a transcendent origin and beginning and a transcendent end. Husbands and fathers should be providers, protectors, and spiritual leaders. We are responsible that the family is provided for. Protector, the husband is called to be the primary source of watchfulness to protect that family and then spiritual leaders. If dad is the spiritual leader of the home and assures that we're going to mass, assures that we're gonna to pray together as a family, he provides a shelter, a shelter from the evil forces, including the evil spiritual forces. We have an incredibly shallow understanding of what it means to be woman. And part of that is because of the fact that we have made the masculine such an ideal. This is what women have been told. But there's something much deeper and richer Women have this capacity to hold others. Certainly biologically, we do that in our wombs, but it also points to something on the soul level. I love St. Edith Stein. I love her quote, a woman's soul is fashioned as a shelter in which other souls may unfold. And what that means is that as a woman, our maternal yearning is to cherish, guard, protect, nurture the other and we do that, of course, biologically, but also we're created to desire to develop and nourish the human soul in others. Children are the greatest gift to families. We have the opportunity as parents to teach, to guide, to love, and then they give us back so much. It's just all such a gift for us. Working in Washington, D.C. as a lobbyist for the National Right to Life Committee, I was in the process of becoming Catholic. I was really studying what does the church teach? What do I believe? Patrick and I met that year at a potluck dinner, and he was already very well-formed and knew what he believed and why, and so that was very attractive to me. She was the first girl I ever met that when I asked her how many kids she wanted, she said, as many as God gives us. And that was my answer as well. We were married on the Feast of the Holy Family. I'm at a practice. We offer comprehensive services for fertility to help couples get pregnant together as a couple and without IVF or without bypassing the problem. So I've been treating endometriosis for 15 years. That is a disease that can affect fertility and cause pain. We're trying to find the problem and fix it. My MO is really good ethics is good medicine. If you treat patients in accordance with the way that we're designed, it should work well. 
We wanted to have a large family. I knew her deepest desire was to have kids. But then we got married and, and it didn't happen for us right away. We had dreams of a large, beautiful family, and I'm thinking, I'm just gonna trust Jesus that he's gonna help me you know, raise all these beautiful kids. We had dreams of our own, and they all came crashing down on us. I suffered from debilitating pain my entire life and was never taken seriously by any doctors. I finally posed the question to Patrick, maybe I might have endometriosis. Turns out, after my first surgery, I had one of the most severe cases that our specialists had ever seen. My job is to help women get pregnant and treat these underlying conditions, and yet I couldn't help my own wife. We actually had a consult with a reproductive endocrinologist, and I just remember in the room, he said, I want to get you two pregnant. And I remember thinking, that is exactly the problem with IVF. Nobody should be getting my wife pregnant but me. <laughs> IVF is not an option because it bypasses the marital embrace. That is the communication, the language between a couple where they can speak to each other with their bodies that is true, faithful, total, and fruitful. We tried and we tried and we tried. We had six surgeries, many dietary changes and supplements, and lots of prayer. And I thought if I could just be so lucky to have one baby, Lord, like just one baby, that would just be wonderful. I never considered that it may be no children. I never imagined that we would be walking that journey that his patients actually walk. Grief is the only word to capture that. We are, as a married couple, to have a posture of receiving from the Lord the gift of a child and not grabbing and taking, and I'm entitled to this, and to realize that he may or may not give, and that we needed to be faithful to him regardless. They say it takes three to create a new life, the man, the woman, and God. Every child has the right to be born directly out of an act of love. The baby is not a product, the baby is a gift. And the way you participate in the creating of that gift matters. We were blessed to be able to adopt our first daughter. I was in the OR when she was born. By C-section, they handed her right from her biological mother right into my arms. I feel so blessed that I was entrusted with, with her and chosen by her biological mom. Well, in the process of undergoing adoption, people would always tell us, oh, you know, when you adopt, you're gonna get pregnant. It was the biggest surprise of my life that after all that, that we were pregnant. We had two babies 14 months apart, so that was kind of a whirlwind. <laughs> adoption is as equal of a miracle as conception. I feel so blessed that I've experienced both. We have a full house, three girls, two boys. The goal of family life, or what it means to be a school of love, is that that is the place that really God has designed for us as children to learn that we are loved and to learn how to love. In any family, even just in a marriage, you have to learn to sacrifice yourself for the good of the other. And I think that is true love when you lay yourself down for someone else. It really is his work ultimately, and we have to cooperate with that. We're there for the kids, but also the kids are there for us to teach us. Children really, I think, bring a certain fullness and life and thriving to a relationship and to family. And children really are the supreme gift of marriage. Part of the challenge of being a parent, right, is you are civilizing barbarians. Like it or not, your children come into the world um, fallen and inclined to selfishness. I don't care what culture you're living in, you have barbarians um, that you're trying to bring into virtue and love and generosity and forgiveness. We have to be instilling and teaching and reinforcing our values and our faith with our children. That's going to be really important because if they don't hear the faith and witness it from their parents, and they're not going to see it in the world, they're going to abandon that faith. When it comes to the question of the things that you might need to consider when deciding what kind of education your children will receive, whether it be private school, public school, homeschooling, I think that with my wife and I, the biggest consideration was whether or not our faith and the truth of Christ would be proclaimed in the way that they were educated. 
it's absolutely essential to remember that even if you have your children in school, do not forget you are their primary educators. For children to grow up to be men and women of prayer, mothers and fathers especially need to show the way. Prayer needs to be a natural part of the life of the home. It isn't enough just to tell our children to pray. We as parents need to set the example. Especially to the dads out there, you gotta be high profile. The unsaid witness of kids seeing you pray, of kids seeing you making it a priority, that message comes across, whether the kids acknowledge it or not, don't ever underestimate the power of your influence and the need, the need frankly, to live not just a bold life, a bold example, but the occasional bold word. Because if we never talk about our faith, they won't see the connection. I think it happens in the ethos of the home. Is the home one where Christian references are made? Are there Christian symbols that are evident? Is there a crucifix in the home? Does the family pray together? Do they go to mass together? Do they practice the sacrament of confession together? All of these things communicate to the child that the Christian life is a vital one and that it's not simply a matter of ideas, but it's also one of lively practice and celebration. Every single day, at our school, I can see children and the way they act, and they're mimicking what they see at home. They look to us, they look to see what we do. They look to see the decisions we make. They look to see how we deal with adversity. They watch us, they watch our faces, they watch our actions, they watch our words. And so if you wanna raise your child in a virtuous way, you yourself need to practice virtue every single day in all that you do.